Welcome to the Personalized Medicine Podcast. This is the place where scientists, clinicians, and entrepreneurs discuss the progress of this rapidly developing field. I am your host, Alexander Yahensky. Let's start. Three, two, one, and we are live. Welcome to the episode eight of the Personalized Medicine Podcast. Today, we are talking about the topic that is very close to my heart, neurological diseases. The mission for this podcast is to bring together scientists, clinicians, and entrepreneurs. And our next guest actually embodies all of those three traits. She is a medical doctor by training, She is a scientist who got her PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Human, Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig, and she is a CEO and co-founder of EcoBio, the company that enables personalized treatments for depression. She is Marina Polakova. Marina, I am very happy that we finally found time to talk, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. So, I would like to start with you with the topic of depression. And before actually meeting you, I have never realized how diverse the molecular causes of depression could be and that different treatment strategies have to be applied to different subtypes of depression. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that heterogeneity and why depression can be so different. Yeah, actually in the scientific terms, we know a lot, and but we also still know very little about depression. We know that there is a genetic background. We have we have done a lot of treatments uh, based on the serotonin, serotonin function in the brain. But later, um, that was still not, those treatments were still not helping all the patients. And the neurotrophic hypothesis of depression was developed, um, telling that um, chronic stress with cortisol, with increased cortisol, uh, decreases uh, neurotrophic factor secretion in the brain. And when this happens in those regions that are responsible for emotion regulation, um, basically people uh, become depressed. And there are many, many other biomarkers and many other theories. I will not lie if I tell you that there are at least 20 different hypotheses of depression. And basically with many of those biomarkers, we see that um, scientifically, when when we do the group analysis, we see the effect. But when we go to the individual level, to individual patient, um, now no of the biomarkers will work for every patient with depression. So basically, depression is very heterogeneous in terms of biology that we observe. It is also very heterogeneous um, de- uh, depending on the symptoms that people have. So depression is a really umbrella term for many different diseases. Some people will have um, problems with sleep. Some problem. Some people will have problems with appetite. And for many of those uh, patients, symptoms will not even overlap much. And I guess this is the main reason why depression treatment so far was so hard to develop. And basically, we know that since the development of the Prozac, nothing has changed changed substantially. So for the last 30 years, at least, we have very few developments. And now people are doing more and more repurposing of these drugs. So hoping to to, to find new drugs. But still, I guess we cannot really stratify each patient individually and uh, adapt the treatment for this patient. Also, um, many of the drugs which are uh, which we call antidepressants now, they are working now on the serotonin system and noradrenaline system. Um, we know probably the first effects, the first pathways that are uh, getting activated by the by those drugs, but it is very hard to predict which are the long, longer term um, changes. And basically, um, we still know know very little about it. And in terms of molecular pathways, what have we learned in the last years that could help us stratifying those patients better? 
Well, I can say probably more about those topics that on which I was working during my PhD. So that was the neurotrophic uh, hypothesis of depression and also glial hypothesis. So in terms of neurotrophic factors, these are really, really interesting proteins themselves. Um, they help neurons to connect to each other and basically maintain these connections or grow, um, or grow these connections towards um, the other neurons and make them stronger. Um, we know that uh, this fa these factors are decreased in when patients become depressed, and we also know that uh, they are uh, reversed, so that their synthesis is improved by the treatment with antidepressants, those that we have so far. Um, this, this neurotrophic hypothesis was very largely developed over the last, let's say, 15 years. And we already know a lot. And at the same time, there is still so much to, to learn about it. Because every question you dig, you try to dig, it's, it's always unresearched. And there are many, many questions that, that come with, with every next finding. And on the other hand, there was a glial hypothesis of depression, which says that um, primary uh, prior to neuronal changes, there are changes in the um, glial cells. Basically, there is like a local inflammation inside the brain, and we can find some biomarkers um, that are spread through the through the brain blood barrier to the blood. So we can we can find them in the blood, and we also see some post mortem changes of the glial cells in the brain of depressed patients. Great. And what those biomarkers that we can monitor in plasma could be? Um, I was working a lot on the on so-called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This is a very exciting protein, which can be either neurotrophic or neurotoxic, depending on the isoform. Um, then the glial marker was called um, S100 beta. This is also a protein that ha that can be um, both toxic and uh, pro uh, trophic, so to speak, depending on the concentration. But we are also measuring a lot of the inflammatory markers, and it has been shown that they uh, so the systemic inflammation is involved in depression. Some of the proteins are also serving as markers of um, treatment. Um, success, so to say, like markers of treatment response. And of course, the stress hormones can be measured. And there are some interesting finding about um, a so-called cortisol awakening response, for example. Um, it's um, basically, it, these are measures of the stress hormone cortisol from saliva. And in, so the cortisol awakening response is a measure of uh, cortisol in the saliva. And in healthy people, um, upon awakening, the cortisol levels are really uh, low. And in the first half an hour, when we wake up, when we become more active and more alert, this cortisol rises. And in depression, we don't see it. We have this dampened cortisol awakening response. And this is also something that changes in, ter um, in the course of treatment. So what I'm also curious about is how can we measure those biomarkers in blood, for example? Are these like typical antibody-based tests or we can use some um, maybe DNA sequencing for DNA-based biomarkers? Or can we use mass spectrometry to detect those proteins uh, in the blood or some metabolites? Uh, or are there any other methods with which we can assess those biomarkers? I think that those markers that we measure currently are measured just on the antibody-based me uh, methods. But of course, there is a big um, future, as, as I see it from my background, um, in the proteomic measures with mass spectrometry. Um, and I'm just not an expert in genomics, but I'm actually a fan of the blood proteomic studies. And I think that um, we can really measure a lot there and also see changes in more than one system. And I think that this will be a future not only for depression, maybe even less for depression than for many other diseases of aging, for example. So as we speak about aging, 
I think it would be worth mentioning uh, the guy whom we are both a big fan of, uh, Tony Viscorai, and his research um, on aging and the role of different blood proteins uh, and biomarkers uh, in that process. So perhaps you can tell our audience a little bit about that and actually why uh, we both like uh, the research that Tony is doing. Yeah. So in my own research, I researched only a few markers, and this is what most of researchers do. What the lab of Tony Viscore does in Stanford is they assess basically as many proteins as one can identif and identify at the current uh, time. In, the, in their latest paper, um, they investigated, they assessed about 2,400 proteins in the blood. And they started actually doing it uh, with aging, looking for those proteins that change as we age. Um, and they published a very, a very exciting experiment uh, connecting the circulation from old mouse with a young mouse, which actually allowed the old mouse to become younger and reversed uh, this process um, for the young mouse and this study has actually showed like proved the principle that one can delay aging and it was one of the strong signs uh, for the aging community and for the way as uh, for the way we perceive aging so for many for many many t for many many years we perceived aging as something inevitable and now it starts to change Basically, we start to understand that we can delay it, we can combat it. And the lab of Tony Vescore is uh, looking for uh, the, let's say, few potential drug targets in the blood that can be to delay aging. So in their latest paper, they, they have found, so uh, they have identified about 300 proteins uh, help with, like, um, with the help of which we can um, assess our age with pretty high accuracy. They called it a proteomic clock. And I think that this approach uh, not only leads us to put new potential drug targets for many diseases, including neurodegenerative disorders, but also for the um, uh, personalized medicine in the future, because all of us have different genetics, we have different environments, and Sometimes, even if we have some genes, it doesn't mean that they will be translated in, into proteins. So basically, proteins represent the way we are, as opposed to genes showing that um, like who we can be. So I think that this approach will be really promising in many, many fields, not only in neuroscience, but, but also for other diseases. Uh, this is one of the reasons uh, why we also wanted to use the proteomics uh, in our company in the future. Yeah, so I think it's a great segue actually to the next question that I wanted to ask you. So with Acubio, you actually want to merge different types of data, including proteomics data, to provide doctors and patients with a comprehensive view on their health. So my question to you is actually, how are you going to do it? What is the biggest challenge in integrating that a diverse set of clinical proteomic and other types of data? Well, if we think about clinical data in proteomics, they are basically in the, in the end, they are just data as a spreadsheet which you can later on use for the machine learning approaches. In terms of the neuroimaging that we want to use, this data um, is a bit more noisy and it requires a bit more pre-processing. And the idea on which we base our prediction is that each individual is a combination of, cert of, of certain proteins and also each individual has uh, the brains which, which were developed um, based on our genetics. And the interaction between these uh, um, ongoing changes in our blood with those changes that occur in our brain will help to predict us the, the way people react on the antidepressive treatment. So essentially, you are planning on integrating the data and then helping doctor determine what type of depression a certain patient has? Basically, if this patient will react on those uh, treatments that are available, so 
it will help to select uh, the best treatment in the future, but also it will help to assess whether the treatment is actually working in the very early phase. Because usually when we prescribe drugs to patients with depression, we have to wait for about three weeks on average uh, to understand whether the drug works or not. And if it doesn't work, we have to change this drug and wait for another three weeks. So what we want to do, we want to predict it as as good as possible in the very beginning and also to assess it during the first week of treatment to to prove whether it works or not. Got it. And what is the biggest challenge from the technical standpoint in doing that? I think that the biggest challenge is actually getting the right data because um, data access is quite problematic. Uh, at, at the current point, there are very few studies. There are actually no studies ha which have assessed this proteomics and imaging markers and also clinical data in the same patients. And um, also the availability of the data from the clinics, which one could really use, um, is still a very hard question in Germany at least. Got it. So essentially that data access is the bottleneck for your company and I guess for many other startups that are trying to leverage machine learning and artificial intelligence for good to help doctors diagnose more patients more effectively. Yeah, exactly. We are doing this show for you and your feedback is very important to us. So if you have any suggestions or comments, would like us to cover a specific topic or recommend a person we should interview, please write us an email to team at personalizedmedicinemedia.com or you can just reach out to us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Just type in Personalized Medicine Podcast and you will find us there. To make sure that you won't miss the new episodes of our show, please subscribe to the newsletter at our website, personalizedmedicinemedia.com. It's one word, personalized medicine media, spelled with Z as in American English. Our website is also the place where you can find show notes for each episode that include bios of our guests, links to their most notable work and projects, and follow-up reads on the topics we discuss during the episode. And now, let's get back to the interview. So, the next question I want to ask you is actually about something that I had to experience myself. How do you combine those different modes of thinking as a scientist, as an entrepreneur, as a medical doctor, and uh, do they get in the way of each other? I think they actually built on one another. So when I started my medical training in the very early years, I was um, assigned to a depression ward where I had to treat depression patients. And actually three of the four doctors were um, absent and I suddenly became responsible for 40 different patients. I, I really didn't know what to prescribe to each individual patient. So I just asked my senior colleague what she prescribed and I did the same. So I know this side of medical doctor, working as a medical doctor. Later on, I tried to go more into science to understand more what, what we really know about all these diseases and the treatments. And now I realize that we, now I understand why I had this problem in the beginning, because the science is still not there to explain us very clearly, very mechanistically what depression is, as we have with different diseases. And now, uh, when I started this an entrepreneurship journey, I had to, to talk basically to those people who are my customers, and they are the doctors, and I know exactly what they feel. And I think it helped me a bit uh, because um, it's easier to talk to them in their language, and also they kind of trust you more. So for me, it was all organic. The more difficult part is uh, learn, learning about all the business processes and learning this uh, business language. But I think, yeah, it's, it's the process which we all experience. Yeah, I guess the hardest thing for me was to get used to tons of abbreviations <laughs> that are used in business. You know, actually, some of those abbreviations sound exactly the same as we have once in neuroscience. 
and you like have to override this term and now we use it, it differently depending on the person you're speaking with. True. So what is your favorite abbreviation that can be used both in neuroscience and in business? Oh, actually, I've put you on the spot. I don't, yeah, actually there is an abbreviation, this ROI, but now I'm more in the, in the, in the science, uh, area it means region of interest but tell me about the business thing i forgot it again <laughs> yeah i think this was return on investment oh yeah <laughs> so same abbreviation but two very different meanings <laughs> yeah and when i yeah. had to make this transition from science to business i was surprised that people talk about region of interest so much here yeah yeah but it happened to be something very very different <laughs> Yeah, my co-founder is more in, uh, coming from this business side, so he teaches me regularly. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> it is a great combination. And I think it is always great to have somebody on whom you can rely in a new environment. Yeah. You've mentioned something that is very important. When you talk to your customers who are medical doctors, they do trust you more because of your medical background. Mm -hmm. But what I have experienced in uh, my entrepreneurial journey, that there is big discrepancy between entrepreneurs who are trying to do something good for human health in their own way and with uh, the receiving end, with doctors and with patients. I guess there are many reasons for that. Often it is a lack of trust uh, or often doctors simply are not willing to change their operating procedures or are just simply overwhelmed with all the work that they have to do and don't really have that much time to listen to somebody else who might have an interesting idea. So what is your recipe for all those entrepreneurs who are trying to break the ice with the healthcare system and try to bring their solutions to clinics? Yeah, I think that this is particularly true for Germany. I have heard that in the US things are different. Also, people from academia are more um, uh, open towards entrepreneurship. Um, as a doctor myself, I can completely understand why doctors are not wishing to change their practices so easily. Because, you know, whatever, whatever happens, the doctor has the end responsibility for his decision. So relying on something which is new, unexplored, never tested in clinical trials is a really, really tricky thing for doctors. And I think that uh, the other thing that the doctors have uh, to rely on are the, um, are the guidelines from the professional medical associations so for psychiatrists, for example, in my case. Um, and uh, basically, only those um, interventions or methods uh, which have been proven by rigorous scientific studies uh, to be effective or to change the treatment um, decisions effectively, only those are usually incorporated in those guidelines. And from the entrepreneurship side, I would say that it is a very, very hard work and it also something that changes, um, that is very different between the consumer startups and the medical startups. So the way for the approval of the product itself is a much longer in, in the me medical space. And because of this, doctors are suspicious, I would say. But I think it also takes a lot of education and it has actually, I think that we also have to change the system a bit more to make medicine a bit more open to startups, to cooperate more and also to do maybe more clinical validation of the new methods that startups develop. Perfect. Understood. And I cannot agree more. I think it is a really important that entrepreneurs understand the challenges that doctors are facing. It is a very difficult job uh, that they are doing. There is no question about it. And very often the first principle in the decisions that doctors are taking um, is not to harm the patient. So I can really understand that extra cautiousness. But on the other hand, that medical community should be 
at least a little bit more open to those innovative ideas because there is a lot of great science out there and patients can really benefit uh, from it in the long run. Yeah, I think that the the big disbelief that doctors have is that entrepreneurs uh, are doing this for money, that people in startups are doing this for money purely. And what I learned recently is that it is not true. Many people, many of those people who start companies, they are very mission driven, very purpose driven. And it is much, much harder to do a startup and to be a startup founder than to be an employee in a big company. I think you can, you can understand it easily. I completely agree with that. If somebody wants to make a lot of money starting your own company, especially in healthcare, is definitely not the easiest way to do it. Believe me, those founders are working really, really hard to bring their ideas to reality. And vast majority of them, at least the ones that we know, are not money-driven in the first place. So I also would like to talk to you about neurodegeneration. Despite intensive research in this field, neurodegenerative diseases are absolutely not solved. We have literally no success in terms of efficient therapeutics for Alzheimer's. Frontotemporal dementia also does not seem to be addressed well. We start having some progress with Parkinson's disease with that new deep brain stimulation. But overall, the situation looks pretty grim. Why is that the case and why neurodegenerative diseases are so notoriously hard? To treat. I think that when we look into the history of science, we, we are used to see some scientific debate. And this is what we were lacking in the field of dementia research for a very long time. The, all, like, the whole field was so much focused on the amyloid theory, and it seems that many alternative theories were rejected in the very, very early stages. So many, many people could not even get uh, funding for their studies. And I think that Due to this reason, we, we do not have any alternatives. And it is only recently that some new ideas start to emerge and finally people realize that, the, that amyloid will not save us all. Basically, that the treatment for amyloid will not save us. And I think that this is the main issue. The other issue is also that we know already that the disease starts way, way earlier than the symptoms ar arise. And even if we want to treat people in the initial stages, so-called mild cognitive impairment, we don't know whether, the, whether, whether each individual person develops uh, Alzheimer's disease in the end. So the conversion to dementia is pretty low, I would say. And it is still quite hard to stratify patients into those who develop uh, dementia or do not do develop it. And also what kind of dementia, it is still quite, quite difficult. It is a very important point that you have raised. Amyloid theory was the most common framework, if you like to think about Alzheimer's uh, in the research community for the last two decades. But now we start to realize that uh, Alzheimer's disease and other dementias are systemic diseases, that they affect our entire body and not just brain. So I'm curious to know, how do you think about it? And what are the other factors beyond amyloid that can contribute to the progression of the Alzheimer's disease? It's actually a good question, but not an easy one to answer. So I think that uh, dementia indeed is something that uh, manifests in the brain but people more and more start to see changes also in the periphery and also as the brain blood barrier change changes it becomes more and more permeable for uh, pr proteins and other molecules from the peripheral blood um, the other factors which are now more and more um, developed scientifically are uh, the viral hypothesis which is which i find interesting and also the inflammation but also some people are now looking into the cardiovascular uh, factors so basically how the affected vessels uh, inside the brain um, contribute to the development of all this neurodegeneration process but it's definitely not an easy uh, question to answer. Yeah, and there are many alternative hypotheses that you have just mentioned. 
and I guess inflammation is uh, probably linked to nearly every chronic disease that human body can experience. And that immune system is really an interesting place to look for potential factors that contribute to the development or perhaps even initiation of different diseases. You know, in, in the very beginning of, um, of my uh, scientific journey, I was working just to uh, screen for potential drug targets in Alzheimer's disease. And, and I did a lot of very boring work where we looked into the protein kinases, which are uh, involved in learning and memory. And we looked whether these proteins are changed, are changed in the mouse model and also in the human brains with Alzheimer's. And this project, unfortunately, didn't go very far due to financial reasons. And we even see, saw some interesting uh, candidates. And I think that if that would happen, if more of this research would happen at least 10 years ago, we might, we would have some other candidates at, for now. Yeah. I absolutely agree. And uh, let's hope that there will be more research directed towards finding those early biomarkers of neurodegeneration. Because as you said, most of the time we detect the disease, but it's already too late. And perhaps the reason why so many clinical trials fail is because they recruit the patients at those late stages who could not be helped anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. And the best, the best uh, result which you can achieve in those patients is just to stop the progression. True. But let's finish on a more optimistic note. So I would like to take a glimpse into the future with you. What the ideal future would look like for research of neurodegeneration? And what do you think will happen to the way we treat depression and other neurological diseases, let's say in the next 10 years? Yeah, I think that I can start with depression because I've worked a lot in this area. So in the future, we will definitely have some AI systems um, installed in hospitals, helping us to basically predict uh, whether these drugs that are, that are available now or psychotherapies will work for individual patients. Also to assess whether the drug is working in the very, very early phase. And this will shorten a lot the duration of treatment and also improve the efficiency of this treatment. I also hope that this system will help to identify new drug targets because psychiatry is the is one of the few areas where big pharma has given up. And but diseases are actually growing and growing comparing with other uh, systems. It just was so hard to to do to have some measurable outcomes. And in terms of neurodegeneration. Um, I think this is a really exciting field and many, many people are waiting for some progress here. So what we really need to, um, to improve the drug discovery and drug testing in this area is to understand the trajectories which uh, those patients have. So some will have only subjective uh, complaints, but never develop depression, uh, dementia. So in terms of neuro neurodegeneration, this is a re an area where really a lot of people are waiting for changes. And a few things have to happen before we really develop uh, significantly working drugs and um, improve clinical trials. So on first hand, we have to predict the trajectories with which patient takes. And this is actually in the field of uh, personalized medicine in this case. So we need to understand whether the person will develop dementia or not, and also what type of dementia, because not all dementias are Alzheimer's. There are many other subtypes, and they also show different molecular signatures. And of course, I would love to see more uh, drug targets, and we are all expecting, of course, for those drugs that would at least stop the disease. And if we manage to combine the first uh, part of the st patient stratification with the drug development, we will actually be able to administer this drug, so the right drug to the right person, to stop neurodegeneration in the very, very early phase and maybe helping them to never develop Alzheimer's. 
And I think that uh, the third thing which we really need to have in order to facilitate all these changes is basically to improve the communication between doctors, uh, researchers, people who start their companies or also pharma companies. And only at the moment when we start understanding, st understanding each other better, we will really make significant change in our progress. Perfect. That sounds great. Let's hope that all of these things will come true in the future. So before I let you go, can you let our audience know where can they find you online? I think the, e the easiest is finding my page on the Institute website uh, for the Max Planck Institute for Cognitive Neuroscience in Leipzig. So there you can easily find my email or also contact me through the LinkedIn. I'm pretty accessible. Perfect. Marina, thank you very much for being today with us on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us today on the Personalized Medicine Podcast. If you like this show and know someone who would enjoy it too, please share this podcast with them. The easiest way to do it is on LinkedIn or Twitter, where you can find us just by typing in Personalized Medicine Podcast. And don't miss the next episode yourself. For this, subscribe to the newsletter on our website, personalizedmedicinemedia.com. We also publish the show notes for each episode there that include our guests' bios, links to their most notable work, and recommendations for additional reads on the topic of the episode. And if you have any feedback or would like to suggest us a guest for the show, write us an email to team at personalizedmedicinemedia.com or reach out to us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Have a great day and until next time.